Payoff.com is a paying sponsor of this Fresh Hell podcast. You've tried balance transfers and budgeting, but high interest rates and unrelenting bill cycles make it almost impossible to get out of credit card debt on your own. Instead of another new savings technique, you need a clear path out of debt. And that's what a payoff loan can do. A payoff loan is a personal loan backed by member-centric credit unions designed to help you pay off your credit cards. With rates as low as 5.99% APR and loan amounts up to $35,000 with no hidden fees and personal customer service support from payoff to help you reach your financial goals. Some of the benefits of a payoff loan may also include potential credit score boost, one monthly payment, and savings from lower interest rates. Go to payoff.com slash fresh hell podcast to learn more. Checking loan rates won't affect your credit score. Try something new. Pay off your credit card debt with payoff. NMLS ID number 1396805. Not all applicants may qualify. Loans only available within the United States. Loan is not available in all states. Payoff works with lending partners who originate the loans. Additional terms, conditions, and eligibility requirements may apply. More information is available at payoff dot com slash fresh hell podcast you're listening to the fresh hell podcast fresh hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us Hi, and welcome to Fresh Hell. I'm Annie in Boston. And I'm Johanna in Vienna, and you just heard True Crime Historian. It sounds like our kind of podcast. So, should we get right into it today? Yes, let's please. Any warnings in this episode? Uh, yes, we're going to be talking about sexual assault, rape, and murder today. So uh, we're not going to get into too many specific details about anything, but it's definitely going to be a part of the conversation. Okay, got it. Okay. I think I'm ready. Sounds good. So if you shop for vintage clothing, which I used to love to do when I was younger, you might know the name Gay Gibson from Dress Labels. According to the Vintage Fashion Guild, quote, Gay Gibson was one of many Kansas City, Missouri labels. The women's clothing industry there was thriving during the 1930s to 1950s, producing mid-priced clothing. The Gay Gibson label dates from 1937. The label was actually owned by the G-E-R-N-E-S, Gernay, Gerns, Gernes. Garment Company. There was not a person named Gay Gibson, end quote. Uh, but that's not entirely true. There was a woman who used the stage name Gay Gibson, and her murder at sea would be an absolute sensation in the 1940s British press. The name Gay means joyful, happy, or jolly. For example, if you have ever watched the Flintstones cartoons, then you might remember that the last lines of the theme song are, we'll have a gay old time. Uh -huh. So that cartoon ran from 1960 to 1966. It was fun kind of looking this stuff up because myself, like everyone born later, watched it on reruns in weekend morning cartoons, right? So it's also a pretty good slot machine in Vegas. But the name gay was actually a unisex name for babies. It was mostly used from the 1800s until the early 1900s when it became more common for girls and less common for boys after the turn of the century. It was a popular name until it became more common used as another way to describe somebody who is a homosexual, uh, which is how people today might know the word. I know a handful of people named Gay, and you may know of the male New York Times journalist and author Gay Talese, or the very talented female actor Marcia Gay Harden. So I just know the Enola Gay, and she was also named after a real woman with that yes, name. Yes, of course. I think it was the pilot's mother's name, but I could be... 100% wrong yep. there. You're absolutely right. You're oh, correct. Oh, nice. Uh, so, but the woman we're talking about today is Gay Gibson, and she was actually born Eileen Isabella Rani Gibson in Jamalpur, India, on June 13th, 1926. Her father, Joseph, worked for the East India Railway Company as a blacksmith. At the time, there was a lot of money to be made overseas, and he and her mother, Ellen, who everyone called Daisy, emigrated to India. Eileen was their third child, and when she 
was five months old, they returned to the UK. But six months later, her father was on another job, this time in Burma, present-day Myanmar, and her mother would stay in England with the three kids. Both parents were devout Baptists, and right about here is where, researching her story, I started to get... Um, annoyed, <laughs> because Eileen is described as a plain child, and that's all right. Didn't bother me that much. I was also a plain child. But she's also described in several sources as being dumpy and having puppy fat. And it's like, she's a child. Could we not? You know what I mean? Mm. But different time. So... Her father came home from India in 1935 when she was nine, and she enjoyed swimming and hockey, but she particularly loved acting and had said from an early age that she hoped to be an actress. In March of 1939, Joseph took another job, this time in Persia, and a year later, Daisy and Eileen joined him, but they were only there a year before they were evacuated back to England due to the war. Eileen was 15 on the return passage, and when they got back to England, Daisy liked to tell people how her daughter had gotten many marriage proposals during the voyage. Seems a weird thing to brag about your 15-year-old, but again, it was a different time. So it seems like by 15, she was already looking older than her age, and at the age of 17, she had joined the Top Hats Gay Dancing Company, which was a tap dancing group. It was 1943, and they performed for soldiers, and the troops manager always referred to Eileen as a gay young thing. It wasn't long before Eileen began using gay as her stage name. She she had big dreams of performing in London's West End and on Broadway, but the war wasn't going to help much with that dream. When she was 18, in the summer of 1944, she enrolled in nursing school, probably because her mom was a nurse and it was wartime, but she soon realized that she wasn't really cut out for nursing work and she quit after four months. But it was only a few months later, in February of 1945, as her mother was preparing to go and join her father overseas again, Gay joined the Intelligence Corps of the Auxiliary Territorial Service, the female branch of the army. Some of you may already know that Queen Elizabeth II, the current monarch of England, and the older lady I most wished was my actual grandma, was also in the ATS. She was the same age as Gay and working as a truck mechanic. I don't have any photos of Gay from this time in her life, but I'll post one of Her Majesty so you can see the uniform, because it's pretty great. When Gay joined the army, she thought she might get to travel to Japan. She had studied Japanese and she was good with languages, but May 8th brought VE Day and the end of the war for Britain. And so Gay joined Stars in Battle Dress, which was a group of performers who would put on plays, concerts, and other variety shows for their fellow soldiers. All branches of the armed forces participated. John Pertwee, who you might know as the third Doctor Who, he was in the naval branch of this group. And his son Pertwee is uh, in my favorite ridiculous film, Dog Soldiers, where a group of SAS soldiers on a training mission are set upon by werewolves. I never heard of that movie. Oh, it's so good. I'm not sure if I should look it up. It's so good. It's so, it's, yeah, we're gonna, we'll have to watch that. It's, it's pretty terribly awesome. So, all right, so Gay's joined this performing group, which is more in line with how she would like her career to progress. She's got a good part in a traveling production, but this is when she also starts to possibly have some health problems. This is in the summer of 1946, and Gay would have just turned 20. According to Anthony Brown, his book, Death of an Actress, is one of the primary sources that I used for this episode. So this is a direct quote from his book, Death of an Actress, quote, In early July, Evelyn Armour, a junior ATS officer was called out late one evening to see Private Gibson after she was reported ill. When she arrived, Gay was laying on the bed face upwards, her back arched. Clutching her chest, her tongue was at the back of her throat, and she appeared to be choking. An ambulance was called. Gay later informed Armour that she had experienced another, quote, turn. Surprisingly, at least a modern medical practice, Gay was not referred to a specialist. Perhaps she wanted to play down the attacks. Certainly, she did not tell her mother, who remained unaware, end quote. Okay, so was it some form of epilepsy? We don't know, and that's the really frustrating thing, because sometimes it sounds like there was a very diagnosable issue, but it was never diagnosed. 
And this is where you start to hear people say she had health problems. There were reports that she was carried unconscious off a truck after a show, seemed like she was having some kind of problems. But at the end of 1946, she was given compassionate leave when her father had accepted a job in South Africa, and she and her mother had planned to join him. So as a part of her leaving the army, she had a full physical, and the only thing that was noted by her doctor was to avoid hot and humid conditions because she had a recurring inner ear infection. So, yeah. And then, again, from the book by Anthony Brown, when she has that physical, he writes, quote, The medical officer also observed that, quote, she was a bit wheezy, end quote, and there were indications that she, quote, had slight bronchitis, end quote, but there was no record of any fits or convulsions. Before undertaking the two-week journey to South Africa on the Carnarvon Castle, Gay saw a doctor for depression, end quote. And we'll get into her time in Africa, but first I have to just say I was thinking that South Africa would be very hot. Uh, So I looked it up to check out how humid it would be as well. And it turns out that South Africa seems to have pretty ideal temperatures, like not too hot or too cold. Mm. Yeah, once again, just really proving how little I know about geography. And Africa, it's particularly hard. It's just, it's a huge continent with a lot of countries. And I can't pick most of Europe out on a map either. So Neither can I with the middle of America. That's a lot more vague than it should be. I have some very weird specific skills, but geography is just, it's not one of them. Plus, I grew up looking at a Mercator projection map, which I think we can all agree takes a little of the blame here for my my ignorance. You're much, much better at geography than I am. (laughs) Uh, So I graduated in geography in high school. I was always interested in it. I just didn't care about the different kinds of sediment and, you know, earth layers and such, which was part of geography here. But I'm pretty good with placing countries and capitals. I actually used to know all the African capitals, but nowadays, uh, nah, I don't think... I don't think anymore. Oh, that's amazing. Where I'm taking you to pub quiz when you visit us. Um... (laughs) Is your high school, like, in the UK, where you specialize and only study, like, a few topics at the end? No, you study all subjects, but in the end, uh, at age 18, you have either three written and four oral exams, or four written and three oral. It's called the Matura in Austria, or Abitur in Germany. I graduated written in German, Math, and English, which are the subjects you have to graduate in. And my oral exams were in English, History, Geography, and Theology. Oh, so that's super interesting and very different from here, where you, you sort of take the same overall subjects, but with some special focuses sometimes. So you might just have a different level. So Paul took all advanced maths and sciences, and I only took the basics of what I had to in those departments. I've always had a really hard time with math. So I'd choose, uh, I did biology and anatomy for sciences when I could. I was better at dissecting a fetal pig than I was at solving for X. And as for geography, I know the states here in alphabetical order because it was a song we learned in second grade that I still remember. Uh, And that's about it. I have no more room. My brain is all just song lyrics and disorganized facts about murder. And I think that you could vouch for that. (laughs) (laughs) I can't remember what we talked about two episodes ago. (laughs) So I think all hope is lost for memorizing capitals at this point in my life. All right. So at the end of the Second World War, there was a rise in immigration, of course, from the UK to several countries which were at that time part of the British Empire. Lots of UK citizens were headed to Africa, as well as Australia, New Zealand, other parts of the world. And so she and her mother set sail, so to speak, on the two-week passage from England to South Africa to meet her father. And they went with a discounted immigrant rate in steerage. And I should say, I have absolutely no idea what happened to her two older siblings, who I believe were both boys. I searched in a few different ways, but all I can say conclusively is that the actor Mel Gibson has a gay brother. Uh, I found her parents' information, and I've got photographs, actually, from the ship's logs, from her travels that we'll share, but I just don't know that much about her family life, except to say that both parents were very strict, devout Baptists. You know, her dad worked overseas, and whenever they weren't traveling to be with him, he was kind of, he was away from the family, which I'm sure was hard. So Gay and her mother, Daisy, they arrive in South Africa, and they travel to Durban, where her father is waiting for them, and it's only about two weeks 
before a 21-year-old gay has had enough and leaves her parents' place for Johannesburg and a boarding house and some space of her own. She would get some acting jobs, and she had apparently grown into a really lovely young woman. So to again quote Antony Brown, quote, Gay was now in her physical prime. She had perfect skin, unblemished and smooth, porcelain white, almost translucent. A male colleague remarked, quote, She had the most beautiful skin I have ever seen in my life, white like alabaster. It was the most striking thing about her, end quote. But it wasn't her only striking feature. She had Betty Davis eyes, sensual lips, and a bob of luxurious red hair that she would twirl for attention, end quote. So... At this time, there are also reports of gay fainting on several occasions and also appearing to have had blue lips. Her fellow actors and crew were worried about her health, and she had allegedly reported that she was afraid there might be something wrong with her heart. But I'm not sure how valid these statements are, because when she died, there would be no autopsy. There are also rumors of her having different boyfriends and of a pregnancy scare. There's talk that Gay was very naive and that a friend had to tell her all about birth control and explain to her that she needed to get a diaphragm. I'm going to go ahead and say that I don't feel her sex life is relevant, even though it was considered to be so at the time. She did have one boyfriend worth noting. He was Austrian and had become a British citizen. He was 33, so 12 years older than her, wealthy, and uh, they did not live happily ever after because he was already married. But they spent several nights in separate rooms, of course, at the Torquay Hotel in Durban, and he picked up the tab. So he was also there to see her off a week later when she got on a flight to Cape Town, where she would board an ocean liner to take the two-week return trip back to Southampton, England. He had reportedly given her about 500 pounds when she left, which was equivalent to a year's salary at that time, so that's a huge amount of money. There were also reports reports of her having been saying to her, like her room steward and different people she met on the ship, how much she loved him. And there was some speculation that uh, she might have been pregnant and he was paying her off. Or was she maybe lying about a pregnancy in order to get back to England in a possible theater job in Dublin? We don't know. There are rumors about other possible lovers. And because this was the 1940s, a lot of the information about her past was talked about in a way that really insinuated that she had it coming, which is exactly why I wanted to cover this case and why I'm not going to talk about it. And honestly, if you want to know all of the rumors and speculation on her sex life and her dating life, there's plenty of sources you can read and you'll find them. We'll link to them as always. And they go into some detail, but we're just not going to. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about the ship. They had arrived on the Carnarvon Castle. Hello to our Welsh listeners. Carnarvon is lovely, great castle and museum. And I'm not just saying that because my 25th great-grandfather built the place. And the ship Gay would leave Africa on was called the Durban Castle. Okay, but there wasn't a castle in South Africa, right? No, no. They just named ships after the famous castles in England. So there was like a Warwick uh, Windsor, all this. And then I believe that this was actually the first ship that they named after a castle that didn't actually exist in Africa. I think there was also a Kenya castle. There were a few others, but at least the name of the ship line was the Union Castle. So it's not total nonsense. You know what I mean? Uh, and is this the same Lord Carnarvon that we talked about in our Tutankhamun episode? Nope, completely different. That was my first thought when, when we went to go see it on our last trip to England. I was all excited. And then, no, I found out. No relation, but equally fascinating in different ways. It's still where the Prince of Wales is invested. So it's where Charles was made Prince of Wales. And then, anyway, doesn't matter. Okay, uh, so let's talk about the ship a little bit. The Durban Castle was built in 1938 for the Union Castle Line, and according to Wikipedia, quote, the Union Castle Line was a British shipping line that operated a fleet of passenger liners and cargo ships between Europe and Africa from 1900 to 1977, end quote. It was built by Harland and Wolfe at Belfast. So the same builders who built the Titanic. Yes, and Belfast is also right at the top of my places I need to visit list. This pandemic has really put in a kink in my travel plans, I'll tell you what. But hi to Colette, good good friend of mine that lives in Belfast. Have you been to Ireland or Northern Ireland? Uh, no, I haven't been to Northern Ireland, and until now I honestly haven't thought about going there. Ireland and Scotland, on the other hand, they are on my list. 
Well, we're going to just have to do a quick swing up when we go and visit Harlan and Wolf because I think they have a really good Titanic museum. Uh, yeah, we did a trip to Ireland for my parents' 40th, and I loved it. Absolutely loved it. We were supposed to be there in March with some of our closest friends, and I'm very much looking forward to rescheduling that trip. Although right now, I've really just got my fingers crossed for Vienna this fall or winter. However, yeah. however long we need to be safe, we'll wait. It'll be fine. And I know, you know, we're not alone in our longing to travel and see the people we've been missing. But yeah, fingers and toes are crossed. All right, here are some ship facts for you ocean liner aficionados. This information is from the website bncstaffregister.com, which I believe is Britain and Commonwealth. Quote, the Durban Castle had a tonnage of... 17,382 GRT, a length of 594 feet, 7 inches, a beam of 76 feet, 4 inches, and a service speed of 18.5 knots. In September of 1939, she was converted into a troop ship. When Greece fell in 1941, the King of Greece and his family first took refuge in Egypt and then South Africa, from where the Durban Castle transported him, his family, and entourage from Durban to the United Kingdom. In 1942, it was requisitioned by the Royal Navy and named HMS Durban Castle. Remaining under Union Castle Command, in 1942, she was converted into a landing ship infantry, with nine landing craft on each side, and on the 6th of November took part in the North African landings at Arzu. During July 1943, she landed the... 41st Marine Commando on Sicily, and later landed troops at Salerno and Anzio. So she, as she had more involvement in the war, later returned to commercial service in 1946, still carrying her AA gun, is it double A? AA gun platforms, and with nine lifeboats on each side, replacing the landing craft. The austere situation was rectified when she was later refurbished. In July of 1947, she resumed service, initially on the mail service pending the return of the larger ships, which were themselves being refurbished after war service, and then on the round Africa service, end quote. Now, the reason that some of this is important, or important's not the right word, it was just kind of interesting to me because Gay was traveling as a first-class single passenger. This was 35 years after Titanic, and I think we all have a vision in our minds, right, of, of what comes with a first-class ticket on an ocean voyage, right? And you just want to see how the other half lives, so to speak. Sure, of course. I picture absolute obscene decadence. Yes, Thank you, me too. <laughs> but no, not in this case. I have literally seen prison cells in Alcatraz with about the same amount of space and personality, but with more amenities in prison. This room was tiny, tiny, tiny. And I was just really surprised. So let me explain. We have photos to post that we will post that really does help you imagine it. But the room has one single bed against a wall. And on that wall is one porthole. And that porthole does open, but you have to call someone to open it for you because it's very heavy. So if you want to let fresh air into the room. There's one very small dresser directly next to the bed, which is really more of a nightstand with a couple of drawers. There's a mirror with a small wash basin, a very tiny closet to hang up a couple of things. And the entire room is eight feet by eight feet. And eight feet is equal to 2.43 meters. So it is a small room. That's tiny. Tiny. You couldn't swing a cat. I don't know why you would. I don't know why that's a phrase, but you couldn't, for sure. And so at first I thought, oh, well, that makes sense, right? Her her room was probably all kitted up from the war still, because this size room would be great, right? If you're in the Navy, you've got a private room, you don't have to listen to anyone snoring, you just would share bathrooms, but maybe less great if you're paying for first class accommodation, <laughs> right? But then I saw the dates lined up with it having her sailing was after it was retrofitted. So first class didn't mean private bathrooms. And then I read in... In a book called Ocean Liners, an Illustrated History by Peter Newell, which I do recommend, that there were only four first-class rooms with private ensuite or attached bathrooms on the Durban Castle, and those would cost an extra 15 pound. I wasn't able to suss out whether it was 15 pound. It must have been 15 pound for the whole journey. I'm sure that must have been it. But apparently, if you wanted your own bathroom, that would cost you extra, even in first class. So the rest of the first class passengers, they all shared facilities that were set up for men and ladies. So because of this, Gay had brought with her a pair of black pajamas. Now, I am also did a lot of research into pajamas of the 1940s because a lot is made of these black pajamas. And I'm 
fairly certain what they're talking about is pants and a button up top. I'll post a photo of the kind of thing I'm I'm talking about, but if you just imagine the first time you go to visit your boyfriend's family, right, the kind of thing you buy to wear to breakfast in the morning, just very demure. So she also had a quilted robe or a dressing gown. Uh, I keep using the US and UK versions of words, and I'm not sure if that's helpful or not. But in any case, all of this is going to come into play. So it's October 10th, 1947, and Gay sets sail on the Durban Castle. Her cabin is number 126 on B deck. The ship is nowhere near capacity. There are only 60 first class passengers on board. They're less than a third full, and most of the passengers are elderly. Sounds like my dream cruise. <laughs> All right. Now, also on board as an employee was steward James Cam. James was born on December 16th, 1916 in Southeast Lancashire. His mother died just two months after he was born, and he was raised by his father and his aunt. He was described in the book as intelligent and charming, but also very narcissistic, unruly, and undisciplined. When he finished school at the wizened and worldly age of 14, he got a job working in a local slipper factory, as you do. But he had grown up in a factory town, and he just, he wanted more adventure in his life. Mm, same. I can relate. Yeah, I think that's something a lot of people can identify with. So at age 16, he signed on his crew to the Rotorua, but that wasn't exciting enough for him. It seems he was mostly shipping butter and wool from England to New Zealand, which, that's red flag number one as far as I'm concerned, because <laughs> who doesn't want to be on a boat full of butter and wool? I mean, again, <laughs> this man is living my dream. But apparently not, not enough ladies for his liking. So he quits that job. And when the war starts, he joins the Merchant Navy Reserve, spending his time on various ships. Ironically, the ship he left was then not long after was sunk by a German U-boat, unfortunately killing 22. And it's a real shame he wasn't one of them. But it seems like he didn't really see much action in the war. He did get married, though, in September of 1943, after a whirlwind romance when he was on leave. What? A soldier? Rushing into marriage? No. He married Margaret, and the following year, their daughter was born. I know their full names, but I want to respect their privacy. By the time he becomes a father, he's almost never home until the end of the war, when he gets a civilian job as a machine operator in the Singer Sewing Machine Factory in Clydebank, Scotland. But again, too boring for him. Five months later, in April 1946, he joined the Union Castle Fleet, which, as we mentioned, was round-trip service for passengers, mail, and cargo between Southampton and South Africa. He started out on the Durban Castle as a cook, but he worked his way up, and he was very charming, and eventually got promoted to first-class deck steward. Life as ship's staff is generally very long, hard hours of work, and in his case, there were long hours, but it wasn't particularly hard work. He was responsible for serving drinks and snacks, he'd make sure passengers were having fun and were comfortable, and he could make quite a lot of money in tips, especially with his good looks. He was often compared in looks to Tyrone Power. Do you know who he was? I had to... I knew the name, but I had to look him up. Okay, he's not my kind of guy. Visually, I always preferred Errol Flynn, who was very good looking, but allegedly a quite horrible, horrible person. But Tyrone Power also played with Marlene Dietrich in Witness of the Prosecution, which is a great movie. Can highly recommend. Oh, I have seen that with my mother, but ages ago. Okay. I know him more as the actor who played Don Diego Vega slash Zorro. And so James Cam was also known as Don Jimmy. <laughs> Because it was a different time, but also because of his resemblance to the actor and especially his history of inappropriate onboard romances with passengers, which was strictly forbidden. Never mind that he was married. That didn't slow him down one bit. I read in a couple of places that he had also been reprimanded for this contact, but was never formally written up. I also read that the girls were not always old enough for consent. <sighs> yeah. So, he's 30 years old when he meets Gay Gibson on the Durban Castle. He's on a voyage with mostly older passengers, so it's not surprising that a younger passenger like Gay would be kept company by some of the younger members of the crew, and it would actually be his responsibility to make sure people had a dance partner or a partner at playing cards or, you know, this kind of thing. But there's always a line that just should never be crossed. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, all right. Now let's take a quick break for a word from today's sponsor, Best Fiends. 
You know, one of my favorite characters in Best Fiends is the Axolotl. In the game, the Axolotl's name is Pop, but one of our listeners, Kelly, has a pair of devilishly charming Axolotls named Thelma and Louise, and now I think of them whenever I use Pop to banish the evil slugs. (laughs) Yeah, Best Fiends is a great way to just give your brain a break as you strategize and play this delightful puzzle game. The game is constantly adding new exciting and adorable challenges, so you really never get bored, and you can play it without Wi-Fi. Ugh, that's honestly such a help to me. I play a lot during my monthly infusions, and the hospital has very iffy Wi-Fi, so I'm trying right now to get all of my fiends to level 20, and I'm getting there. Also, if you want, the game will pick the best characters for you to beat a level, or you can customize your team, because every level is different, and you can get as strategic as you want, or just keep it very simple. That's right, yeah. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this 5-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. So, a week into the voyage, on the 17th, Gay had gone to dinner and dancing in her lovely uh, formal black evening gown, and she had been walked back to her cabin by friends around 11.30. She was then later seen smoking a cigarette and looking out at the water. She told a member of the crew that her cabin was a bit warm and she wanted to cool down, and that is the last report of her being seen in the early morning hours of October 18th, around 1 a.m., A few hours later, just before 3 a.m., night watchman Frederick Steer was alerted when the service bells of Gay's cabin had been pushed several times. Now, I should explain here, and I've got a photo to post, but when you look at the picture of the room, or the cabin as they're called on ships... Now, you remember I said for a first-class cabin it was really tiny? So... The bed is pushed up against the wall, and then next to the bed was like a a tiny little panel, and at the top of the panel was a little reading light, and then beneath that were a switch to turn on the reading light, and a button to call for the room steward, and a separate button to call for the room stewardess, as they were called at that time. And I tried to find out specifically how they differed, and I couldn't really find anything, so if any of our listeners know, I'd love more information, but I assume because it was the 40s, I'm guessing it was something like... Like, if you needed clothing taken care of, or laundry, or a zipper zipped, or tea brought to you, maybe you call the stewardess, and the steward would handle things like opening and closing the porthole, or helping you with luggage. I'm just not sure, because I love cruising, but usually when our steward comes, I'm like, here, just give me fresh towels, sit down, have a cup of tea, because it's exhausting. So I, I don't know. But the thing to take from all this is that for whatever reason, you would generally call for either the male or the female stewardess, not both. Like, you would just never call for both. And there were two lights outside the cabin to show who had been rung for. So Frederick Steer makes his way to Gay's cabin, and he sees both the red and the green lights are lit, which is odd. Uh, He knocks on the door, and after a bit, the door is open just a sliver, enough for him to recognize James Cam, who immediately shuts the door in his face and says through the door that everything is all right. So Steer goes back to work, assuming that either James Cam had already responded to her summons and was handling whatever it was she needed. He was known to bring late night drinks to passengers if they requested it, or that he was having a romantic evening with the pretty young actress, as some sources claimed he boasted he would. Steer did tell a co-worker or a superior, he told someone he was working with what had happened, and then he just really thought nothing else of it. But yeah, it's understandable. I would have found everything to be in order as well, but I guess nothing was actually in order, am I right? Yeah, you guessed correctly. Yeah. It's like, no, everything was fine. It was... (laughs) End of story. (laughs) End of story. And that's... Join us next week. (laughs) <laughs> so the next morning, Gay Gibson is nowhere to be found. So the name of her female room steward was Eileen Field, and she came to bring her her morning tea. And she found that the room was unlocked, which she thought was very odd, because even though guests were encouraged not to lock their doors, they were told everything was very safe. Um, and so it was better to leave the doors unlocked in case of an emergency. Gay usually did lock her door, but the door was unlocked and there was no sign of her. And then she noticed some odd stains on the sheet and was surprised to see that the poor hole was open. It wasn't very long before they realized that Gay was missing. They paged her with no response, and soon they believed she was uh, had possibly had fallen overboard into what is always described as shark-infested waters, <laughs> because... 
Of course it is. Arthur Patey was the captain, and he immediately turned the ship around and began a search. He also immediately informed the Union Castle Line's head office about the disappearance. Unfortunately, they were not able to uh, find her body. But when this is all happening, suddenly that night watchman realizes those service bells that were rung might be a little bit more serious than he had imagined, and so he reported the incident. James Cam denied ever having been in Gay's room and said that Steer was wrong, but he'd also suddenly taken to wearing a really, like, a long, a heavy long sleeve jacket when short sleeve uniforms were the norm in a hot climate, and so people started to suspect him, but he claimed he had heat rash. Okay, but wouldn't you try to avoid sweating even more if you suffer from <laughs> heat rash? This seems to be really a stupid and rather suspicious explanation. This guy was apparently not a quick thinker. Yeah, I agree. I don't really, I mean, unless it was such a horrific looking rash that you had to hide it from the passengers, so they didn't think you had some sort of creeping, creeping rash. <laughs> There's nothing more exciting than when somebody brings you a meal and they've just got a festering creeping rash, but no, I agree. And the captain received instructions from Scotland Yard's Criminal Investigations Department to, quote, padlock and seal the cabin, disturb nothing, and that CID officers will come aboard in Southampton. Now, given how often we talk about crime scenes where the crime scene is just destroyed almost immediately, this I thought was just such a nice change. They really locked down the room. They took everything. I've got photos. Uh, but the police, they got it right this time. I'm honestly quite impressed. As you say, so many times crime scenes get destroyed, even if the police can get there almost immediately. But here, I mean, they're on a, on a ship in the middle of the ocean and they handle things rather well, given the circumstances. Yeah, they really did. The captain had the ship's doctor examine uh, James Cam. He made a note of deep scratches on the right side of his neck, his shoulder, and his wrists. And then Cam was placed in the brig and handed over to the police when they got to Southampton. Cabin 126 was photographed extensively, which we'll share. And then it was kind of dismantled. They removed, I don't know whether, I don't know if they removed the actual porthole or if they brought an exact replica of one in as evidence. But it's pretty impressive. For 1947, Scotland Yard was not fucking around. At first, James Cam tried to just flatly deny that he'd ever even been in her room, but the eyewitness evidence from the night watchman had just made it impossible to keep that lie up. He then said that he'd gone to deliver her an evening drink, and she had opened the door wearing nothing but a see-through nightgown, and she seduced him. Yeah. It's just, I don't know what woman would ever buy that. I think men would believe that happened. I mean, it's possible if they were super flirty beforehand already. I guess so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's possible, but would you risk it? It's one thing if someone was coming to your house, but if you were in a hallway where other people were walking by all the time, would you open? I mean, it's possible I <laughs> did this at one point in my life or not. Who knows? I love you. Good girl. <laughs> I'm living vicariously. So anyway, he claims that she seduced him. He said that while they were having sex, she then suffered some sort of medical emergency, stiffened up, and died. He tried to revive her, but she was completely dead, and in a panic, he pushed her body out the porthole window. She's tiny. She, she wasn't a big woman, but also it wasn't a big porthole. So it's not like he, like, just tipped her over a balcony. Like, it would take some effort. It's awful. And in another interview, he remarked that her body had made, quote, a hell of a splash when it hit the water. Like, oh my god. And he was surprised that no one had heard it. So that was his only real remarks, were just that how surprised he was, sort of, that he didn't get caught. And many of the articles that you read about the case, which was known as the porthole murder, and was very well known at the time, they mentioned that he probably thought that if there was no body, there would be no crime. But we all know better, that had already been proved untrue a few times, uh, even though the press would say, at the time, the press would say, well, no body mean, no conviction, you know, this yeah. kind of stuff. But a lot of our listeners know about Camden Wonder, which goes way, way back, and we'll be covering that one of these days. So he was charged with murder on the high seas in March 1948 at Winchester Crown Court. 
At the trial, the prosecution stated their case. They believed that the evidence proved that James Cam had delivered a drink to her room, then forced himself into the cabin where he tried to rape Gay, but she fought back, hitting the call buttons frantically for help, and Cam, in a panic, not expecting her to fight back, strangled her. He was in the process of pushing her lifeless body through the porthole when he was interrupted by the night watchman. The defense stated that Gay had seduced Cam by opening the door wearing only a see-through nightgown. They maintained that she died of natural causes during consensual sex, and that although he tried to revive her, she was dead, and that when the night watchman came to the room, he panicked, and while Cam had acted very badly by panicking at the thought of losing his job and family, he did not murder her. Witnesses for the defense included people who knew Gay from her acting career, and she was described as being physically ill and pregnant, as well as hysterical, because of course she was. They called witnesses, including her mother, to testify to her having had a few sexual partners before marriage, and when the prosecution objected to this, the defense said that it was important to determine if she had been, quote, over-friendly with men, making her rape likely. No huge surprise here, given the time, but also, fuck that guy and his judgmental patriarchal bullshit. This is partly why I really wanted to cover this case, because I was shocked reading it how victim-blamey the whole thing is. But seriously, how can that still shock you? I know, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. But some of this stuff is relatively new. Like, some of these books are... It's not like these books were written 40 years ago, you know what I mean? Yeah, okay, but it's about a case in the 40s, and it's how people thought back then. Well, I know, it's true. That's very true. Yeah, people still think that way today. True. Some, unfortunately, still do. So, here is some of the more compelling evidence for the prosecution and for you. James Cam had changed his story six times and had been accused of sexual assault and rape in the past, but nothing ever came of it, and the past sexual assault allegations were not considered admissible evidence. The room steward testified that the bed was unusually rumpled and stained. Dr. Griffiths, the ship's doctor who examined the scratches on Cam's wrists and shoulders, testified in his opinion that the marks were made by someone defending themselves and not someone experiencing a seizure or any other medical emergency. The stains on her pillow were blood stains, and the blood type was O. Since Cam was type A, it was believed that these stains belonged to Gay, as did the urine stains found on the sheet, which the doctor said were more consistent with strangulation than with a heart attack or with any other kind of natural death. Now, you remember earlier when I said she had those black pajamas? There was a reason for that, and it's because they were missing. So she was probably wearing them when she was pushed out the porthole. Her modest, full-coverage pajamas and not a sheer negligee were missing. And her diaphragm was in her toiletry bag. Doesn't really sound like the facts paint the picture he claimed of her looking to seduce him. And if what he had said happened had happened... Why not just leave her in the room for the steward to find the next morning and have her death ruled natural? Exactly. Yes. Yes. That was my next point. It makes no sense. It would be so simple to just, like, even if he was attacking her, if he had just left her in her bed for them to find... It's also worth mentioning that her mother, a nurse, testified at trial that her daughter was healthy, with no issues, and that she had undergone an army physical and passed. I don't know how comprehensive army physicals were during the Second World War. You'd think they'd have caught something serious, though, like a seizure disorder or a heart condition, don't you? I guess... But I'm honestly not sure, as she was not going to see combats. She wasn't on the front lines. Yeah, yeah. She might not have been checked that thoroughly. I I really, I don't know. It's possible. It seems like, I don't know. But essentially, the defense just tried to drag her reputation through the mud. That was really their only defense, which is ridiculous. And thankfully, it did not work. After four days of trial and a whopping 45-minute deliberation, the jury found uh, James Cam guilty of murdering Gay Gibson, and he was sentenced to death by hanging. But at that time, there was a debate going on about getting rid of capital punishment in England. And so because of that, his sentence was commuted to life in prison. When Prime Minister Winston Churchill heard the news, He's quoted as having said, quote, The House of Commons has, by its vote, saved the life of the brutal, lascivious murderer who thrust the poor girl he had raped and assaulted through a porthole of the ship to the sharks. End quote. 
It was also after his sentence was commuted that, according to Michael Grace's piece on the murder for CruiseLineHistory.com, so he writes, quote, Several women came forward to tell how Cam had sexually assaulted them on previous voyages of the Durban Castle, two of them claiming they had been raped. Another woman said she had been attacked on deck by Cam, who dragged her into a tool room where she fought desperately as he tried to strip her clothes away. He had lost patience and strangled her. She passed out, she claimed, and when she regained consciousness, she said that Cam was standing over her, grinning, end quote. Jesus, that's absolutely horrible. I think I speak for most women that often we find ourselves in situations where we feel safe in the company of professionals like bus drivers or train conductors or taxi drivers. And to have these very people assault women makes it even a tiny bit worse. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, because you were a flight attendant, and I look to flight attendants in that way. I mean, literally, these are the people who are supposed to be, they're not just there to serve you, they're there to help in an emergency. They're trained in a way that you are not, so absolutely, 100%. I get what you mean, and I agree. Get ready to get really angry, though, because James was released on parole in 1959. So he went from a hanging sentence to about 11 years in prison. Now, I believe during this imprisonment, his wife divorced him. When he got out of prison, he changed his name to James Clark. He remarried, and I'm not going to get into any of that in order to respect his family's privacy because they were victims too. Eight years after his release, he was working as a head waiter when he was arrested for sexually assaulting a 13-year-old girl. He was sentenced to two years probation. He then went to Scotland, and four years later, in 1971, he was arrested for sexually assaulting three underage girls. I believe they were 10 and 11. And it was only then that he went back to prison, but only for another seven years. He was released from prison again in 1978, having served a grand total of 18 years for multiple rapes and murder. So then he got a job at a golf course where, again, people found him absolutely charming. And I'm very happy to say that he dropped dead of a heart attack in July of 1979, age 63, hopefully before he had a chance to rape anyone else. Okay, you know me. I'm usually not one easily to wish death on people or, you know, want to be happy about someone dying. But in this case, I'm gleefully saying, good, I'm glad yeah. he's dead. Yeah, so I agree. He protested his innocence of the murder until he died, but... That happens all the time. There have been several articles, books, and even a TV program suggesting that James Cam was wrongfully convicted of murder. This is a big thing that you'll see if you search out the case, that he was wrongfully convicted. And they've got testimony from people who acted with her, who report that she did have health problems, and they say, yes, I saw these health issues, and they said that she was very unwell, and that they believe that she very well may have died of a heart attack when he was raping her, or trying to to rape her. And so he wouldn't have been guilty of murder, but rather manslaughter. But I'm just going to be honest and say, I only read a couple of these articles and then I just had to stop because it just made me so angry. Like, why the hell is anyone interested in even partially vindicating a man who repeatedly raped women and underage girls? Like, yeah. he admitted to shoving the possibly still alive because he said he tried to revive her. But I mean, if that's even remotely true, she could have still been alive. And if he, if not, then he strangled her to death and then shoved her out a porthole window miles off the west coast of Africa. He called his own behavior beastly. They did searches of the beaches, by the way, but they never did find her body. But there's just, it just makes me so angry because, I don't know, there's just, there's a real, even in more recent articles, there's just a, maybe he didn't murder her slant to everything. And it's like, okay, let's say it went down exactly as he said. How is anyone defending a man convicted of sexually assaulting prepubescent girls? Like, yeah. why? He didn't serve that much time in prison. I know it was a different time, but not that different because it's that same, like, silence and shame that so many rapists depend on to get away with it over and over and over again. It happened then. It happens now. I would bet anything that every single person listening to this right now, you know someone of any gender who has been sexually assaulted or raped, and you probably know nothing about it. And, you know, it's why we support people when they come forward and why we just hate false accusations and why I don't understand anybody wasting on their, you know, their time trying to kind of make it seem like what he did wasn't maybe that bad. I don't know. Yeah. Like, what difference does it even make? Yeah. Why are you wasting your time on it? Let it go. 
So that is the very abbreviated story of the murder of 21-year-old aspiring Broadway star Eileen Isabella Ronnie Gibson. So, sad. Thank you. This was so sad, so heartbreaking. I never heard anything about it. Um, yeah. I will have to look her up now because I'm yeah. really intrigued and really interested. She did a play, the most famous play she did, and I didn't cover that much of it. There's, there's information in my sources. I just, you know, I didn't want to get into too much. But she did a play with a famous English boxing star, I think. And that was the thing she was most known for. But she was beautiful. And she was, she was just so young. And you just look back at your life when you were 21. And it's like, yeah. the things they said about this poor young woman, my heart breaks for her and her family. It's just, it's so sad. So if any of them are listening, if, if, you know, Gay Gibson was your aunt, then we're really sorry. She got, she shouldn't have been treated that way in the press. It's sad. So yeah. Do you have a something happy? <laughs> is there anything good this week? <laughs> so my something good this week is that my husband can finally come home for vacation. <sighs> he was supposed to come end of March. Of course, the pandemic changed everything, but he can now come home for a couple of days. We haven't seen each other in over four months, and he hasn't been home since Christmas, so I'm so happy. I'm trying not to be too excited yet. I'm still too scared that, again, something could change. Yeah, he has to go through a lot of testing to be even able to come home and then, you know, be able to go back to work. So it's all handled very responsible and... uh Obviously, now I want to work a bit ahead because as much as I love you and our listeners out there and our podcast, these couple of days will be only for us. Oh, yeah. I'm so glad for you. And we've recorded a few in advance before so that we can take a little break from the murder. Yeah. I think people understand that. And I really, my something good is um, I just really want to thank you uh, for taking on the lion's share while I've been struggling a bit with physical and mental health issues. It'll all be fine. Just, you know, rougher than usual patch lately and my mom died and you and my family have just, uh, just been great. I'm... I'm so lucky. And the happy news is that our puppy is home. His name is Opus, and we absolutely adore him. We're crate training him, and he cries unless you talk to him. So every night, we're in bed talking and hoping he'll sleep. And last night, I was on the floor in front of his cage, just like using my soothing dog voice, trying to be like, everything's fine. You're calm. So now I'm like, I'm going to do like a big long loop of that so I can just play it so we can go to sleep. <laughs> But yeah, he's a bitey little heathen puppy and we're exhausted, but he's the best thing in our lives. We love him and I'm spamming the pet thread on our Facebook group with pictures of him. Speaking of Facebook, thank you so much to everyone who has friend requested us. I have an Instagram that you can follow if you want to. It's pretty much identical to my Facebook page. It's just uh, no politics and no photos of the kids in my life or friends and family who have jobs at you know, require more privacy. So you can find me on Instagram. I'm Annie.FHP for Fresh Hell Podcast. So that's easy to find. And doesn't Opus have his own Instagram account now as well? Yes, I did because I'm ridiculous and taking pictures of him constantly. He's Opus underscore. Do I have to say underscore or just Opus the Dane? We'll find him. I know. I'm going to learn how to use Instagram with Opus's little account. He's a funny little gremlin. <laughs> And of course, please follow Fresh Hell on Instagram and Twitter and come join our Facebook group. Yes, topics of interest in the Facebook group this week include harrowing tales of survival by hellions who have been terrified and harassed by geese. Also, lots of house porn, including a mansion with an entire fake city like in a Las Vegas mm. casino in the basement. I love that the movie theater double feature was Mary Poppins and The Exorcist. <laughs> I mean, that's just perfection right it's there. It's the best. It's the best. So yeah, you can find all of the places to... Um, find us on our website, which is www.freshhellpodcast.com. Please, if you have a moment, leave us a quick rating and a review on iTunes. That would be amazing. It really helps people find us. Please also tell your pets we said hi and we love them very much. They're all very good boys and girls. They really are. And until next week, if you're going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. See you next week. <laughs>